Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to each and every one of you who are here with us today. Welcome to all of our guests, to all those who are listening in online. Welcome to our regular attenders, and welcome to our members. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, we thank you for who you are, for your majestic being and the creation of life, for each and every way in which your providences shape our daily affairs. We thank you so very much for how you tenderly love us and care for us. And Father, we thank you so much for your precious Son, Jesus Christ, that because of your love, because of your perfect righteousness and justice, because of your infinite holiness, you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us that you rose him from the dead and seated him at your right hand for our sake. We thank you that sin is defeated, that death is defeated, and that eternal life awaits all who believe. Father in Jesus, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit who is here with us and among us. Now, Father, we do pray that your Holy Spirit might Use your word to convict us, to teach us, to reprove us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness. Father, if you are here, if your Holy Spirit is here and working, then we know that your word will have such power. But Father, if it counts on me, this will be nothing. And so we pray that you would work through your word as you have promised in each and every one of us. In your name do we pray. Amen. Are we stewarding everything that we have well based on a perspective from eternity? This is the question that the parable of the dishonest, dishonest manager begs us to ask. The substantive point from the parable is this. Be sharp. Full, uh, I'm sorry, be sharply insightful and discerning with the use of everything that you have, including your time, energy, your stuff, and your money. Based on the information that we have, that Jesus has been crucified and raised from the dead, and that we will have eternal life with him. Based on the information that when we die, we will carry nothing with us, we therefore must be responsible and giving with what has been given to us. Now this morning, we have a very full schedule, so I'm going to pull out highlights and golden nuggets from this text for us, and we're simply going to work through the text at a rapid clip this morning. And so we have this parable. It was read to us earlier. There is a manager taking care of a rich man's resources. And this manager uses the funds inappropriately. What's he do? We're not sure. He squanders it in some manner that we're not aware of. And yet it has been misused. And so the manager is calculating about his circumstances. He analyzes the circumstances in which he's in, and he says, hey, I need to come up with an advantageous solution for my future. And in order to obtain those future prospects, the manager forgives various parts of debts that are not his to begin with. And that's part of the point of the parable. 
Nothing that we have is necessarily ours. It is all God's to be given to us to steward well and wisely. In this case, the dishonest manager, who has been dishonest with certain amounts of funds, begins to think, hey, I need to be helpful and generous with this stuff that isn't mine to begin with. And what's he do? He forgives debts. Now take a look here in the text, verse 6. In the English Standard Version, the ESV, it reads, he said a hundred measures of oil. This is from the debtor's speech. The debtor is saying, I owe about a hundred measures of oil. Well, in the text, what this means in the Greek is that he he owes about 900 gallons of oil of olive oil. So if you look in the grocery store and you're thinking about the case, you're thinking about the case of milk, you're thinking about the gallon containers of milk, you're thinking about 900 of those filled to the brim with olive oil. That's about the amount that he owes. Some footnotes may give or take, you know, 20, 30, 40 gallons, but it's about 900. What does this mean? It means if, the, if that owner had a very large olive grove, which is unlikely, it would be one year's worth of good yield from that very large olive grove. That's how much the debtor owed. And notice then, What the wise man or the the dishonest manager, but the shrewd manager says, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Now it's about 450 gallons, give or take. It's a much more reasonable amount that the man owes the master. And take a look then at the next person. The next person owes about a hundred measures of wheat in the ESV. Different translations may have different uh, amounts and different measurements tools. But here in the ESV, it says a hundred measures. Now, this equates to about a thousand bushels of wheat. By that terminology, we were much more familiar with. It's a thousand bushels of wheat. Here's the thing. In the ancient Near East, this would be 20 times the annual yield of a typical family farm. Remember, they didn't have modern farm practices. You're looking at much smaller territories, much smaller yields per acre. And so it's 20 times the annual yield of a typical family farm. About a thousand bushels. And notice then what the man does. It's commended, but basically by Jesus and by the master. The the dishonest manager says this in verse 7. Take your bill and write 80. He doesn't cut it in half like he did for the person with the olive grove. But he cuts a substantial portion away and forgives that debt. The point is that the dishonest manager is shrewdly evaluating his circumstances and acting in light of those circumstances. The point is is not be dishonest with other people's money. That is not, that's missing the point if we're thinking that. Okay, the point is be shrewdly insightful with reality That all we have is from God. When we die, to to think about John Wartburg's title of his book, it all goes back in the box. Okay? When we die, it's over. We don't take anything with us. Therefore, we must be insightful with what we have now. And take a look. This is exactly where Jesus goes. Verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world, for the children of this world, are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light, than the children of light. 
What's the point? Be insightful with reality and do what is most advantageous for the future, which is eternal life for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. And look here in verse 9. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Well, what's that mean? Here's the thing. Unrighteous wealth does not mean um, that we are to steal other people's resources in some way in order to give them to other people. That's not what it's talking about. The unrighteous wealth in the parable is simply the stuff that we have now. That's all. It's not, it's not saying, well, uh, all, the, all the stuff and things that we have are stolen. It's not that. It's simply within the context of the parable, the unrighteous wealth that we have is everything that God has given to us. That is the key. And then the second point is, Make friends for yourselves by that means so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Now, I want to correct a, a falsehood that sometime is, sometimes is done. The falsehood is this. Poor people will always go to heaven. That is not true. Only Jesus Christ saves all those who are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ they are the ones who are saved. So what's the point that Jesus is talking about here? When we think about it, it's this. Use the means and things we have now for the purpose of the kingdom of God to share the gospel with others and provide for their means so that when we enter heaven, we will see them there also if they receive the gospel. Okay? We need to interpret this within the context of the entire Bible and understand what Jesus is saying here. And what's he saying? Be shrewd and insightful. Steward well the things that you have. Now, in the Gospel of Luke here in chapter 16, verses 10 through 13, Jesus uses one example of this. Remember, at the beginning I said, use all of our resources, our energy, our time, our abilities, um, use our finances, our stuff, use everything for the kingdom of God. Here, Jesus uses wealth as an example. And he says this, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to true riches? Well, again, then we have to capture and recapture and restate that point that the unrighteous wealth is simply everything that God has given us here. What then is the righteous wealth? It's eternal life. The righteous wealth is the things that God will give us that will be ours forever. And the point is, if we are faithful with the little, that doesn't mean if you're faithful with a penny. Okay? A penny is a little. We need to be faithful with that. What, it, what the little is, is everything we have in, on this earth. That's the little. What is the much? Those things of eternal significance. That's the much. And he goes on. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Well, what's Jesus saying? Again, it's the same point. Everything that we have now on this earth is not ours to keep. It will all go to other people or another, one way or another, when we die. What is ours forever? Those things that are eternal. 
eternal life. That is what is then given, that is, our own, flowing from God forever. And then Jesus makes this point, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Sometimes it's mammon, right? It means, it means the money God, so to speak. Why can't we serve two masters? We can't serve two masters because if we are in service to money, money demands self-interest. It demands the accumulation and the constant accumulation of more. If we serve God, then it's a life of sacrifice and giving. It's a life that is lived for others. So what's our practical application from this parable? Again, the main thrust, the main point is be sharp, sharply insightful with the time that we are living and live out your faith in Jesus fully, stewarding all things well. Now, for the time and the talents and the abilities that we have in stewarding them, I do recommend going back and visiting that, stir- that sermon on the parable of the talents, where we went over that really thoroughly. For today, since Jesus' example is wealth, we will also focus there on money and wealth and stewarding those sorts of resources. So first, let's go over some basics. To steward money well, we actually have to know where it's going. And that means a budget. At least a hazy budget. List off costs and where they go. Now here's the second part of that, and I'm sure that we're all familiar with these principles, but it's important to teach us again and remind us to help us to steward things well. First, portion off a part of your budget for giving. Flat out. The recommended amount is about 10%. If you can do more, that's awesome. If you can't reach it, that's fine. The estimated amount is about 10% to give. Then here's the thing where we begin to think sacrificially. Think about different line items in your budget. Let's say anybody have an Amazon fund or a Walmart fund or something like that. You begin to say, all right, these are for those purchases that are going to be coming from certain general stores. And as you begin to steward your resources and think about it, we begin to say, well, can we take a portion of that, maybe monthly or maybe quarterly, and also use that for the purposes of God's kingdom? Do I really need that third ladder? Do I really need this brand new toy? Do I really need that, right? We begin to simplify and ask those questions so that from that line item, if we have extra, we can then give. Another part, I'm I'm, hopefully we all have something like this. We probably have something like a hobby fund or maybe a cable fund, okay? From that hobby fund, we then begin to say, well, actually, you know, Instead of buying this item I want, this movie, this new television, uh, you know, a new gun or whatever it is, instead of buying that, can I instead take a portion of that once a quarter and do what? Give for the ongoing use of the kingdom of God. Give to a missions organization. Give to somebody in need. Give to Bible translators. Same thing with cable. Here would be my challenge for everyone who's paying over $120 a month on cable to watch commercials for half the time. Once a year, once a year, turn, disconnect the cable Turn it in. Once a year for one month, turn it in. And take those funds, 
and give them for the sake of proclaiming the gospel. Or, you know, if you have certain channels, let's, let's even take it down a notch. Maybe there are certain specialty channels that you have. I, I, I don't know. Um, the, the one that's coming to my mind is one that my dad watched, which was like the Westerns or something like that. Could watch, uh, what is it, Smoke and Guns or something, you know, 24-7. What is that? Gunsmoke, thank you. Yeah, see, we're familiar with that. The Westerns channel. Disconnect it once a quarter. Take that $20 and give sacrificially. Right? Begin to think in those ways. In what ways can I tighten my belt just a little bit for the sake of the gospel to steward things well? Right? And this is about sacrificial giving. One of, the, one of the places where this just broke my heart, I was reading um, the denomination I belonged to before this was the Brethren in Christ. And I was reading about the beginning of their missions organization. And when they started their missions organization, what people did was they literally tightened their belt and they would go without food for three, four, five, six days in a fast. And they would take their food budget and give to start proclaiming the gospel in other countries. What a challenge. What, we're saying we can't go without cable for a month? Right? I, where, so we, we have to ask this question as we're stewarding our resources. We have to ask, how can we live a bit more simply? Not all the time. It doesn't have to be an ongoing sacrifice. It's not never being without cable. But it's saying, hey, how can we steward these resources well for the kingdom of God? Be sacrificial. Now, I want to also encourage you all, you at South Union are amazing givers, so thank you so much. And there's so many of you who are saying, I already do all that stuff. Amen and hallelujah. Thank you so very much. Um, I do want to, want to just say thank you, thank you, thank you. Even as we go over these principles once again, you all are exceptional. Thank you so much. Glory to God. Now, Here's the second part. What about our possessions? Are there things that we can give away? Re remember that um, stuff that we have in the side of the closet that is saved for when we finally do that weight loss program? <laughs> right? Take this stuff and go give it away. Right? Right? How, in what remember that stuff in that one closet or the shed that we have and we haven't touched in 3 years and there's cobwebs all over it now y'all y'all know what I'm talking about right cuz we all have that stuff clean it up give it to somebody who can use it in what way can we live simply and give unused things, things that haven't been used. Here's the litmus test. If you haven't used it in about two years, for clothes, it's probably more like a year, year and a half. But if you haven't used stuff in about two years, you're probably not going to be using it, except for that exceptional tool that you use once a decade. Right? We all have those too. Okay? But think carefully about our stuff. And how we can be generous to others in sharing the gospel and in meeting other people's needs. I'm going to end with this for today. It's a commentator from, um, on Luke. His name is John Noland. He says this, The worldly wise steward has shrewdly appraised the situation that confronts and threatens him and has moved quickly to situate himself for his best advantage in the future. Would that those who know the truth of the Christian gospel could see things this sharply and as effectively align their actions to the situations that confronts them. In light of Jesus Christ and eternity, what will we do? Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so very much for you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would teach us. We pray that you would help us. We pray that we might live sacrificially for you. In the strong and precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.